Welcome to Podnuts Daily, episode number 295. As you know, we uh, this show is about computer repair. We have technicians come on the show as guests and divulge secrets of computer repair, what their techniques, what they're doing, um, business ideas, business tips, uh, geeky tips, virus removal tips, and um, we try to get punch as m- pack as much into about an hour as we possibly can for you guys. And we hope that it helps you as computer repair technicians. So uh, let me introduce the guest for today. Today on the show, we have Greg Jackson from supergeeks.net. Hey, Greg, how are you? Good. Thanks for having me. No problem. You look very comfortable. It looks very sunny, and it looks you, you must be in a very nice place. I'm yeah. in Hawaii. Yeah, it's awesome here. <laughs> oh, man. Is it like that all year round? Um, you know, different parts of the island um, that rain a little bit more than others, but uh, I'm in a kind of in a rainy area, so there's a little valley, and I'm on the other side of the ridge where they would film Lost. I don't know if you've ever seen that program. Of course. You're, you're on the other side of the ridge, like you could walk over? No, no, no. Oh, it's okay. a pretty big island. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's rainy on the North Shore, and they, they are on the North Shore side. So you are on the island of Lost? No, uh, <laughs> I guess so, technically. <laughs> Damn. That's amazing to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, watching, you, that, watching that you show. You see Hawaii now, too, right? I haven't seen it, no. But the guy from Lost, is, one of the guys from Lost is in it. Do they do that Jim. there? They, they film it there? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we'll we'll see crews. They got a local newspaper that uh, shut down, and they're repurposing that building for episodes for the uh, that that show, Hawaii Five O. Damn, that's pretty cool, man. Yeah. All right. So, uh, tell us what you do. It's your first time on the show. First of all, I want to thank you for coming on. Absolutely, for the first time. We love, like I said before, we love having new blood on the show. And uh, so, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm I'm the uh, director of business services for Super Geeks, and um, you know my role is to uh, interface with the customer. Um, you know, if I if I see opportunity for um, uh, business services that we can provide for our existing customers, or we run into uh, residential users or residential customers that um, have either home businesses or no people. So really building relationships with our, our existing customer base for PC repair. And then hope, you know, we, we hope to grow that into kind of a business relationship. Now, what is super geeks exactly? Is that your computer repair business? That, uh, it's the business that I work with. Um, so they've been in, in business since 1998. They, um, were around right before, uh, the, um, geek squad folks came on board. So it, it, there used to be a lot of parallels and the geek squad folks has really kind of changed their business model and they do, a, uh, it seems to be a lot less business support. So, um, we, uh, we hope to, t- you know, substitute, uh, ourselves for, for the, for their customers. So it's, it's not too much business support right now for super geeks. There's, there's a pretty good handful, but, uh, you know, there's always room for growth. I'm looking, you know, to really help expand, um, what they have now. So they want business customers. Absolutely. Yeah. I got because I think, I think there's in terms of, um, business model, I think that when you can get reoccurring revenue that is on a prepay or a managed care service plan, I think there's, um, it makes it better for everybody. The business doesn't have to worry about, um, how they're supported. We don't have to worry about drumming up new business and we're just filling up the pipeline. You want to have a good, you know, 20, 30% of your income or revenue is generated from consistent, uh, a consistent stream. And then the other stuff can come from, you know, fluctuation. Huh? I see. So do you, do you get your hands dirty? Do you do the technical work or you, do you try to just organize everything? Um, yes. <laughs> I do it all. <laughs> well, how did you get started? Um, um, just just in, com- in computer repair. Well, so I used to work with my wife in, in the accounting department and uh, I'm going really way back. Yeah. And uh, she, you know, I was going to school and she said, what are you going to school for? I said, accounting. She said, really, that doesn't fit you. And um, at the time I was building an access database to really manage uh, ticket flow. We were an accounts receivable. So our job was to take calls from people that had disputes and process them. So I guess really how I got started was, convincing um, our accounting department to invest in RAM because when we started doing the access database, that really started, um, you know, sucking a lot from the RAM because right. it's, it's a resource hog. Right. And um, then I made a career change and a, and a degree change. I, I 
changed my degree from accounting to MIS, and then uh, went to work for um, a local PC shop. And the way they, the way we negotiated was seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour plus commission, and they would train me. And that was back in ninety nine. Plus commission. So you mean on sales you yeah. got? Yeah, I had to. It was the feet were on the pavement, man. It was really? it was rough. Yeah, that's pretty cool, though. That's pretty cool. Yeah. What is MIS? Management Information System. Okay, Management Information Systems. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's it's, cool. um, you know, I I, ha I have a lot of buddies that have I have comp sci majors, and you know, there's a lot more math involved in that. But I, you know, I'm. I'm probably a strong MIS guy, and I'd be a really weak comp sci guy. Right. Yeah. Go where your strengths are. I think it's a good move. Yeah. All right. So, um, what did you want to talk about today? Well, I, I got a couple things on my mind. The first thing is, um, I've got a, um, I, I, I currently have an Epic 4G, and I know we were talking for a while about, uh, in one of your past episodes, there was, uh, can you talk and be on the internet simultaneously? And the answer is yes. Um, I do have to reboot my phone into 4G first. So there's a couple things. There's 3G, 4G, and Wi-Fi. Um, for some reason, the phone isn't very good at changing gears, like from one network to, to the next, but it will simultaneously do data streaming and a voice call uh, on 4G and on Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if it's on 3G and it's sharing that voice uh, pipeline, then it's not going to do it. It's Verizon or... That's Sprint. Oh, yeah. it's Sprint. I Sprint. see. Yep. Okay. Yeah, what we were talking about, Donald, Android App Addicts? Or Nuts at Night? I can't remember which show. I think so, yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, it's really useful because uh, sometimes you're talking to a customer and you're trying to find out where they're located and GPS doesn't, believe it or not, GPS doesn't always work here. There's some some new communities here, so you kind of have to be quick on your feet. So anybody who has an Epic 4G phone can can uh, benefit from that knowledge. Yeah, and there's no rooting or anything like that. It's just the traditional OS that comes with it. Okay. Is it Android? Yeah, yeah, okay. it's an Android 2.1, I believe. 2.1. It must be a Samsung phone. It is. Okay. Yeah. Cool. A good tip for Android yeah. users. What else? Uh, the other thing is I wanted, I wanted to give my opinion on certs. I know that was on another one of your shows. Um, the, the cert thing, definitely do the certs. The certs, um, it, you may not always think that um, – I've met a lot of people with certs that don't know what they're doing, but the certs are for you, and they're for your resume. Um, they're for you to really show competency. And, uh, you know, I, the last um, – position I had, I had 10 employees and we had a very structured certification process. And, uh, we, we, um, sat down as a team and we discussed it and, um, it just, it's really for the technician and it's really for your resume. It kind of gets you in the door. It doesn't always get you the job, but, um, I think they're very valuable. You know, it depends. So, it depends if, if you, you said it's for your resume, but it's, it depends who you want to show your resume to. If you want to go into business for yourself, yeah. it, you, I don't think you need them. Uh, if you do want to get a job where somebody's going to like judge you on what on what you've done and what your knowledge, then yeah, I do agree with you. I do. Well, but, I get if you're Microsoft certified, you do get to use the logo. So if you are in business for yourself, use the logo. I mean, it's a small price to pay, right? If you take two tests for the MCDST uh, desktop support technician. You can get to you get to use the logo. I mean, that's, that's you're right. Use Microsoft I, name. Right? Yeah, that's that's good too. Now yeah. you've you've taken you, I take it you've you've taken that test, got the certs. Does the did the knowledge you learned on that help you, or did you do it just for the cert and you already knew everything you needed to know, or does did studying for the test and getting that knowledge help you? Um, studying for the uh, no. <laughs> you already what, you already knew all that stuff basically. No, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest here. I I had a good good knowledge base, but what what going through that process did for me was, you know, it was more of a it was more of a cram session for me. I had to had to do a lot of studying in a very short period of time, and what what that studying did for me it was a, it was a, considered a boot camp. And what it did for me is it took all of my field knowledge, and I I'm gonna use the term loosely, but 
it's the difference between a mechanic and an engineer. A mechanic spends all his time, you know, doing the work and actually going through it. But the engineer knows why things are the way that they are. Okay. So you, you know, you really have to, so what I did is I was a field guy that ended up um, getting why things are the way they are. And then you end up learning through the process that it's the Microsoft way, just like Cisco has its own way. And um, it just really takes what you know and breaks it down into something that you understand um, in a framework that that's going to help you in the future. But it didn't really help me in, in the field case. You know, you don't need to know too much about when you're at a computer, when you're, when you're working on a computer and you're at a customer's house or your right. customer's business. Right. They don't really understand all the certification stuff anyway. So how did it help you, though? I know that I know how you said it put everything in a framework and it may, gave you understanding. But how does that did it help you? Logic. OK. Um, you're just able to figure out things better and. Yeah, I mean, when, there's a couple things. One is, can you think yourself through a problem? Do you do you understand Active Directory? Do you understand routing? Do you understand subnetting? Um, those concepts that you kind of have to be really familiar with versus, you know, the shade tree mechanic that just says, I wonder if this wire is going to work. I wonder if this is wired. And that, don't get me wrong, that, that's valuable because you, you should know how to do that part too. You should be able to experiment. But at the same time, you know, my, you know, my wife's brother is really smart and sometimes let him and I, him, him and I will get in, into a conversation and he'll just say that doesn't make any sense and I'll ask him why and then he kind of breaks it down and uh, sometimes just logic is, is there's some guys that have never seen stuff before that have really good grasp on logic and they can talk themselves through the problem without ever experiencing the problem it's I pretty see. amazing I see right, well how, how much does it, does it cost to get Microsoft certified taking that test it's way too much money. It's like two twenty five a test, and you got to take. I did my stuff like in two thousand two, so um, you've got. My, I think my certification, my certification was all the way up to MCDBA, which is like ten tests or something crazy, and um, it was better that I crammed it all into two weeks because um, it would have been hard for me to do one test at a time. I can do things in one or two test chunks over yeah. a course of time, but sure, sure. Um, yeah. So it was it, know, would, it, it would be about two grand or twenty two grand, twenty five hundred bucks? Yeah, about twenty five hundred bucks if you just take the test. Then you gotta go and get your CBTs, you gotta get some books. And this is leaving aside any classes that you take. So mm -hmm. um the way we had it when uh, I had my team of ten guys, it was you know, everyone would just kind of spend their lunches going through um, you know, books or they'd test each other, they'd go through some test modules. Um right. If you can find a partner, that's really, really important. Now, when you had you had this team of ten guys, was it working for Super Geeks, or was this your own business, or, or what was that? Uh, I was the IT supervisor for Cox Communications, and um, it was specifically desktop support. We interfaced heavily with the engineer folks. Um, spent a lot of time on virtualization, IP telephony. This is all internal. We supported a lot of field folks. Um, so we, you know, we dealt with air cards, laptops. Um, a lot of applications that were heavy on the bandwidth. Um, it was it was a lot of fun. Cool. That sounds pretty neat. Now, yeah. did having those certs help you get that job, or or the job you have now? Well, the job the job that I got at Cox, the conversation sounded like this: um, you were hired because you can call a spade a spade. And I think what that meant was you understand. The short answer is I don't think so. It might have played a part into looking at the resume a little right. bit longer, but my ability to work through that logic and when a technician says it's not working, um, I think one of the things that I really brought to the table was, well, walk me through exactly why you think it's not working. And then we would discuss it and then figure out, okay, well, um, reinstalling the operating system isn't always the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, your opinion is duly noted on the certs. We have we have varying opinions right. coming through. But like you know, I, I I like to say, it depends on what you're going to be doing, what your thoughts thoughts are in the future. If you don't want to work for anybody, then you might not need them. You know. But if you if you are wanting to get a job in an IDT department somewhere, then yeah, it's a probably a really good idea. That's what, that's what I think. There's you know, so, yeah, you know that's that's a real tough one because I think. I think you, what, one thing you said that is, that is really important is you have to know how you're going to present those things. Right. But I got to right. be honest, there's a, there's a lot of people that don't really, they don't really care about my degree. And that degree meant a lot to me. It meant mm -hmm. a lot about 
um, me being able to work through the degree process and um, it shows your ability to go through the process, to dedicate yourself through it and show competency. I don't, I mean, there's a lot of guys that have degrees or have certs and they don't, they don't even know that you can stick in a, you know, a DVD into a computer and install the OS. I mean, it's, it's pretty funny, but you know, don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dog it too much. I, I really yeah. think there's a lot of value in it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. What else you want to go over? Sorry, man. <laughs> what? No, I, I, I totally, I'm, 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 I'm not arguing one way or the other. I'm, I'm happy you're bringing some very rational thoughts to the subject. So we need that. Okay. <laughs> what else do you want to talk about? All right. So, you know, I, I just got really curious about the whole Google apps thing. Um, I started getting really curious about that a few months ago. And um, then I heard you talk about it on one of your shows. And I think this is a really, really important um, business opportunity for a lot of folks that are, that are working on their own, um, their own business. And I think easily, I forget the guy's name that you were talking to, but you know, he was, I think you guys mentioned a few times that he was under, he seemed to be undercharging. <laughs> yeah. And I, and by the way, I think you're right. You totally charge for service. These people, you know, other people charge. It's okay. Um, quality bill for a quality job. So, um, on Google apps, I think it's, you know, it was a little bit more complicated than I think it should have been, but it's a, it's a huge added value. So for you to be able to go in and charge somebody, you know, 400 bucks for you to get them set up. Cause they're, you know, if you go through this Google apps process, the customer is going to be able to manage themselves with any amount of time investment. Um, it's not like the old days where you'd have to find a good interface for them to manage themselves or build a whole back end for their website. Um, all this stuff is really, really easy. So I, I set up, um, just for fun, I, I set up hawaiitechguy.com and I, I set up my own email and it took me, the first time around took me probably two hours. I mean, that was with transferring the MX records and uh, I didn't do the web, the web part. I just did it for fun to do the, cause the MX records are really the, the most useful, I think in terms of a lot of companies that have a website, but they don't have email. Right. Um, right. I think you, you've talked about that on plenty of shows where you're like, you know, some guys got yahoo.com right. or Gmail and they're supposed to be representing themselves as reputable. It's kind of, you know, I kind of scratch my head at that and go, really? <laughs> so uh, I just thought that was really important to kind of bring up, totally sell the service, get familiar with it. Um, you know, even if it's just your MX records, be able to speak to it. And then, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, the, the other thing that kind of ties into this is a lot of people don't know that they can have their Google or their Gmail accounts pop their, their existing accounts and be begin to segue people off of their existing email. And then um, that's the first thing. The second thing is you really want to do something like that because a lot of guys have just PST files locally. I was at a, uh, a business the other day with a construction site and um, they were asking me to pull up their, their PST file from a drive that had, uh, you know, choked on them for whatever reason. I right. think it was like a virus or malware. Right. And um, I couldn't find the PST file and, and, you know, I told them, you know, you could have your, if you have to have it the way that you're having it, uh, you know, use Outlook, save your stuff locally, and then have Gmail pop your stuff and save it on the, uh, in the cloud. Oh, so, definitely. So definitely. I, I, I used to save everything to my hard drive too. And then switching over to Gmail is amazing. Now it's, it's, you know, with the Google apps is not, it's basically the Gmail interface, but it's yeah. not, it's not, it's, it's Gmail, but with your own domain name basically. Right. Yep. Um, I, I have to plug La Lalo. You guys know Lalo. Um, he created a product, a set of videos with like eight or nine awesome uh, techniques that he uses. And uh, in his computer repair business, he does scripts and, and all kinds of really cool stuff that not a lot of you guys are doing. And uh, how to set up Google Apps is actually part of that. We're probably going to introduce this product tomorrow or really oh, soon. Cool. So if you still are hesitant on doing Google Apps, his product will cover it from like it's a, it's a screencast video and it just covers it from from A to Z everything you need to know if you are hesitant on it at all if not you know if do it yourself or whatever but um def Lalo's product is definitely 
you, you should be interested in for the other things that's are, that's included in it as well. We'll go over it later, but just wanted to plug that real quick because I know that that's coming up, and um, a couple of guys have talked about uh, using Google Apps, and I think it's a great idea. Like it's like you said, you don't want to use like Hotmail as your email address for your business or no. something like that. It's very important for professionalism. Yeah, totally push the the, the uh, videos that Lalo has because I think it's. Well, I was I was going to touch about this, uh, touch on this uh, briefly, but I think one of the things that we lack um, in the IT industry is the ability to communicate techniques successfully. And we had this internally uh, at companies I've worked for before, where the corporate office doesn't always, um, you know, they're, everyone's busy, and you know it's tough to be able to not only do the work but then communicate. Um, communicate that work out. And, uh, I was, I, I think some of the things that you guys are doing are, are great. Not only sharing the video, but being able to, um, you know, what you're doing with Lalo and, and your website. I think that's awesome. I please continue to communicate that stuff out. I, I don't, I think technicians, um, you know, we, we really have to balance being able to keep our nose, um, in the problem and that can absorb you. And at the same time, still be able to turn to your, left to right and communicate what you're doing to a customer. Cause you know, a lot of times they're just right there. It doesn't matter whether you're at a business or, or someone's house, they're right behind you asking you what you're doing or why you're doing that. And uh, yeah, it, there's communication is critical. I know at certain points as a technician, I mean, for me, it was my own business, but for, for anybody else, communication is just key. You have to know how to communicate well because you can have the best ideas in the world and people have had the best ideas in the world. And if they can't communicate them properly, the idea will never come to fruition. You'll never get the desired result. So um, you're right. Communicating and, and really knowing how to do that well is a, is a huge part of being a tech. I mean, it's it's a it's a yeah. plus. It's it's a plus. A lot of technicians might get so sucked in on their screen and what they're doing that they don't yeah. they don't look outward and communicate with others properly. Yeah. So uh, it's it's something that I think it's a great skill to have. Some people equate uh, being a technician to being a doctor. So if, if the term bedside manner means anything to anybody, you know, it, it means a lot to me. Yeah. I, I can't tell you how many times I have to ask being, you know, being able to ask the right question so that you can, I would rather ask more questions that are pointed and get to the problem sooner than have to, you know, scoot o tell the guy to scoot over and let me take a look at the problem and I'll, I'll let me, I'll solve it for you and then leave. A lot of times people, people want the experience. They want to be able to learn something while you're there. And, and, you know, the reason they called you and they're going to pay, you know, $150 an hour. Um, they just like a doctor, they just want to go, you know, why does my arm do that when I, when I move it like this? Right. And a right. doctor's guy, you know, a good doctor is going to be able to explain that in, in a way that the patient's going to understand. Right. So yeah, exactly. communication is absolutely critical. Huh. Good point. So, so uh, that actually ties into my next thing, which I really, really wanted to, stress um that when you have a customer in front of you i think it's uh, one of the things that we're we're um, focusing on as a company is the ability to take our captive audience people that are walking in uh customers that were currently at their location and be able to ask them about other lines of business and i think it's really important you know whether you're just working on a pc or you're, you know i think eventually if you're you know there's some guys that that have the ability to only work on PCs. And I think that's cool. Um, I just don't, there's two things that I get concerned about when people say they're a PC repair guy. One is you're going to get tired of doing the same stuff over and over, or when business is slow, what else are you going to do to get more business? And in both cases, you really need to know more about your customers needs and wants whether it's you're working on a PC and you ask them how their wireless network is doing, or, you know, do they have any audio video equipment that they're currently, you know, a TiVo or do they have a uh, Blu-ray disc player that goes onto the web or, you know, how are their devices working? And it's really interesting that if you just kind of bring up that small talk, you can generate a lot of business just by people knowing what other services you provide or you want to provide. And huh. you said it before you, you, um, you know, you, you didn't always know what you were doing. You didn't intentionally make a customer a lab rat, but at the same time, you weren't, you weren't uh, afraid of taking on something that you haven't done before. Right. That's a great point. I mean, you go in a lot of times. Well, I, I know I did. I'm, I messed up a lot. I got to admit, after listening to all you guys, after I sold my business, I could have made a lot more money, but, um, 
you're right. When uh, you're at a customer's house, you go there to fix the job that they want you to fix, and then you, you're done, you get paid, and you leave. But what you're saying is uh, just probe around a little. Ask like some probing questions like how's your wireless network or do you need, do you need anything like a printer and, and, and start throwing out stuff and, you know, antivirus. And you could generate a lot more money than what you originally went there to get. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And, I, and, I, and if you're, you know, having trouble coming up with questions to ask, just uh, use the same questions that your family member or friends ask you. Hmm. Um, also, plug in things that are free, like the Google Google Apps or, um, you know, telling people that you can do two-way video chats on your phone or, you know, how to back up stuff. Recommend free things because what you're going to provide isn't the thing. The thing that you're going to provide is the service right. to get that thing working. Yeah. Right. So you'll still get paid for doing the service, but they Oh yeah. The price will be cheaper cuz you don't have to buy that thing for them. Yeah, there's no there's no purchase required. Right. Yeah, exactly. Very smart, man. Do you have any other examples of what what you do like to to uh to plug other things while you're at a customer's place or A lot of it's just asking them, you know, it's it there's a lot of similarities. The language is different, but there's a lot of similarities between asking a a business owner, how their business is working because they have something on their mind and it's not really the computer or the thing that you're working on. If it's a router or a server or a raid card or whatever the problem is, um, they, you know, that, that's not really um, the most important thing for them. What, the most important thing for them is their business. So what you'll find is um, you just ask them about how their business is doing. If there's anything that uh, is, I mean, literally questions like, so what keeps you up at night? Uh, what kind of things, you know, what kind of things are you guys working on? And they'll, they'll open up a whole can of worms for you. We're working on, you know, scanners. We're, we're working on um, data storage. We're working on our website. We're working on, ask them how their customers are doing. And then literally something's going to pop in your head like, well, I wonder if they're doing this. Huh. Like you literally should be asking that question. Are you doing this? Right. And what does that look like? How do your customers like your website? How do your customers, um, you know, are your customers hanging around too much at the service desk or, you know, how do you guys use your phones today? Huh. Really interesting. Just get to know them. Right. That sounds interesting. Yeah. Communication's coming back into the picture again. Exactly. Yeah, that's key. That is good stuff. So I haven't, I haven't heard, um, a couple, a couple other things I wanted to mention were um, the. Uh, have you guys talked about experts exchange? I know once. I think I heard you guys talk about it one time, and you guys it wasn't it didn't sound like a good conversation. It was a long time ago. We did talk about ex experts exchange. We were critical of it because <laughs> you couldn't uh, get the answer to the questions that you wanted unless you paid. And then we found out you just if you scroll to the bottom of the list, you'll find out all the, the answers that people gave. Not the number one answer, but you still find the answers people gave if you didn't pay. Right. But yeah, that's it was we just didn't want to pay at that point, I think. <laughs> I I gotta tell you, I've gotten for the you know, the twenty bucks or so that you pay annually, I've got a lot of answers off there. And I, you know, Google's great. It's got a good good combing tool, but there's some times where I just don't I mean have you ever been in front of a customer and you've looked for a problem and something pops up that you don't want to be looking at? I mean, there's, there's some, sometimes there's a really good reason to be using expert, expert exchange. And I think, um, I've used it, uh, in several different jobs and I recommended it. I've, I've had a really good success. I'm, uh, how much does it cost? Really... 20 bucks a year, you said? Yeah. I mean, you can, if you get more licenses, then you can buy down the price a little bit. That's only I mean, 20 bucks a year is not bad at all. No, no, it's not to get rid of the ads and have a consistent look and feel and you're, and you're familiar with it. Yeah. That's, I think it's important. It's worth I, it. To be honest, I was going to mention you guys should probably do something like that in terms of, uh, we were talking about windows, um, windows updates and stuff. I would, you know, I know right now you can go to news groups or you can go to, um, you can use torrents or something, but I think it'd be really reputable to have IT resources, kind of what you're doing with Lalo, it sounds like, is to be able to have, you know, a current OS that has all the updates slipstreamed into it and somebody's kind of verified that it's a good, you know, good ISO or, um, you know, I, I really think that if you guys had something like that, that, um, you know, you just add a checksum, put it in torrents and then put your name on it somewhere, but I'd pay for that. I'd, there's a, you know, even in the corporate environment, we didn't have um, a consistent ISO for our, for our stuff. We had to send, we literally took an ISO 
we would upload it to Dell and then Dell would burn it onto the, you know, they, they would just basically push the uh, image onto the hard drive. So if we had something that sh we could share amongst each other as IT people, I think that'd be really useful. And I, you mean just an ISO of Windows or an ISO of what? Yeah, a uh, window, you could do something, you could start with something as simple as Windows with all the updates. Uh, it's got the latest service pack, latest updates. I'd say nothing more than a month old. And, um, you know, you'd, you'd be able to, to you know, we, we had talked about the three-in-one that uh, you do with, uh, not uh, not TechNet, but Microsoft's got their, their little switch that you add onto it. And then you can get whatever ISO that you want, like a home or um, or pro. Oh, really, I don't know how to do that actually, but I get what yeah, you I get what you're saying. That would be a good idea. So you mean to come to like the the Podnuts forums or, or someplace on Podnuts and be able to uh, buy the yeah. service of having the up, most up to date Windows ISOs and stuff like that? I don't know if okay, I okay. So yeah, it, it, that's exactly right. So I'm all I'm saying is if there was a way for you to put your put your name on it, I'd probably pay ten or fifteen bucks a month just for that. And the reason I'm and I mean maybe maybe I'm like you know being being too cheap here, but it's the amount of time I burn just on updates, a lot of times customers really don't like me. See, they don't like me doing nothing. They really kind of like to see me moving. Mm -hmm. And I, and I try to talk and move at the same time, but updates are one of those things where often I'll just tell them, look, I'm going to put, you know, if I'm doing XP, I'm going to do SP three for you. And then after that, you're kind of on your own. And sometimes right. that stuff blows up. They don't, you know, they don't feel comfortable pushing the updates down. Right. So if I had something that was, you know, a month old at the most, um, I think that'd be pretty cool, uh -huh. or or even like a little checklist of all the you know added apps that uh, you know that's a certified um, you know like the Linux distros do the same thing, right? They have like you know here's this Linux version, and and by the way, it has these ten apps that come with it. Right. I, I think it'd be kind of cool. I'd pay idea. for it. That's a good idea. You should do the business. You should start that. <laughs> <one>. <laughs> I'm not busy enough. You're right. <laughs> that's a great idea. I'll think about that. Let's see what the guys in the forums think. Yeah. Cool, man. All right. What else you so, want to go over? Anything? So I was, well, I was, at, I wanted to share this experience I had at this ortho, orthodontist office. It was, um, you know, I, I worked for about five years as that, as that leader um, of the IT uh, um, team. And I really started to forget a lot of, the experiences that I had, I mean, I, I, I found that I didn't know as much as my people did. <laughs> really? So yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when you're, when you're in management, you just, you're dealing with people issues and admin issues and, and you're, uh, you're not talking about the same things. You're still talking, you know, you, you really want to have conversations with your employees because you forget the good times. Huh. But now that I'm actually doing a lot more field work, um, it was interesting because I, I remember a, a, sh a couple of shows ago, somebody was talking about how they recommended that the, um, that the customers actually go to their vendors first if they have a vendor application specific problem. And I, I, I don't have an opinion either way. I just wanted to share, I do have an opinion, but it, it's not really, I can't articulate it because I, I, I understand both sides. So the situation I had was a customer had, um, I'll just say the apps. They had uh, OrthoTrack and Dolphin. And basically what it allows you to do is get um, take your x-rays and put them into a 3D format and then spin them around and look at them. Okay. But what I found through that experience was that after spending, you know, it was a very long time. I only did five or six laptops and about seven PCs. And I spent probably a good 50 hours getting this thing on the network and, and attached to the domain. That's, that's a really long time for that little amount of PCs and laptops. Right. But what I found was that these applications, even though these guys are taking everybody's money, they're not written very well and they're not written, to, they're not written well to work with other applications that um, take business from them. So these two compete in certain genres of their, of their business line. So they're not, they're not compatible applications. But what I found out was that, um, once you, I mean, there's a, there's a whole business. What, after this experience, what I'm figuring out is that I should specialize in the, I should specialize in dental software. <laughs> right. Okay. I get where you're going. You know, one of the things that I found out was that after talking to the vendor, I probably called them, I don't know, almost 10 times. Right. And I probably got seven different people. And 
by the time I got to the sixth or seventh person, six, six or, I'm sorry, sixth or seventh phone call, mm -hmm. I knew more than they did about the customer and what the customer needed. And I thought to myself, you know, this is my first time doing it. I've been able to accelerate my learning curve. Um, why don't I start, you know, partnering up with some of these, these, uh, these vendors and um, maybe become the preferred, be on the preferred vendor list. So if they, you know, someone like Dolphin or OrthoTrack wants to get somebody deployed, um, they can call me out. And um, I think that's really, really important, especially in an economy like now that we partner up individually, we partner up uh, with other companies to really leverage um, branding, to leverage their business line, um, to show that you're kind of wide, um, wide spanning in terms of your knowledge base. I think that's really, really important. And I've, I've met a couple other businesses where I walked in, I, met, I went into this other doctor's office and he asked me to replace his PCs. And then I come to find out that the company that he was getting his, um, his medical record management system, if you will, th what I found was that they were managing, they installed their printer, um, printer ports, the printers, the network, the wireless, and the internet. They literally owned the entire process or experience for that doctor. And when I, when I called up for support, they immediately said, who are you? And they kind of questioned me. And I just thought it was really crazy that these guys had the, they basically got the doctor on the phone and got mad at him for inviting us out and told him that it was going to cost him extra money to fix these problems when they had all the logins to the router um, the printer IP, you know, the schema for the IP addresses for the printers. It was, um, it was, I think a lot of people are just trying to own everything inside the business. So you, you really using business partnerships right now are really, I think really key to getting in and get, building trust. And you, so you're saying you think it's a good idea to, uh, do what that company did and try to own everything or you're saying like specialize in I guess, I guess the problem in specializing in software is you don't know how many times you're going to need that knowledge. I mean, how many times are you going to install Dolphin? Unless, unless, I guess if you get on the preferred vendors list and then Dolphin calls you whenever they have a customer that they need to send you out to, is that what you're saying? Well, you know, I don't know. Okay, so first thing is when you talk about these applications, you're absolutely right. How many times are you going to install Dolphin? Probably not a whole lot, but you might be able to keep your rate higher. And you might be able to become a dedicated technician so that anyone in your area that has this software and needs support, hopefully the vendor's going to, going to recommend you as a fix agent. Um, hopefully the, um, the people that you're doing business with only want to have you go in because for every, every time someone new has to come in, they got to unwind or unravel the mystery behind how to make everything work. Mm -hmm. And you know, they had, they had several issues where I had to go into config files, dot INI files and, you know, twist things. And, you know, some things were, I, they were fairly generic in terms of technology, but some of them were specific to the application right. and everyone, you know, everyone pretty much can uh, modify an INI file, but there were, I mean, there were plenty of times where um, I was in there and I said, you know, there's something wrong with your config file here. Let's just try something and see if that works. And then that worked. But, the customer to avoid having to pay me additional hours. What they tried to do was manage the conversation with their vendor. And they, they ended up calling me back and said, you know, I can't fix this problem. I spent two or three hours. They remoted in and they couldn't fix it. And I said, well, that's because the first guy told me how to do it and it worked. And the guy that you're talking to, it's not working. Huh. So it was, it was really interesting. Yes. Yeah, so I, I get what you're saying. How, how do you, how do you suggest that uh, people you know, partner up with these, uh, vendors, cause just call them a lot. Of, a lot of times it's do a good job while you're helping the customer and then let the customer know that you're, um, that you've taken notes and you've put it in there. Hopefully you've got, you know, a, a CRM or something that you're, you're entering this data in. Um, a CRM could be anything from what Microsoft has to just, a a notepad, you know, basically, a uh, a file that you keep on every customer. Last time I was there, I did this, we worked on this, this was the fix, here's the file. Um, you know, in between upgrades, what you'll find is that um, customers have, they have to call their vendor. And if you can build that trust, they'll call you just to help with the vendor. They don't even want to get involved anymore. So um, I've, I've plugged, I worked for a lawyer that was doing 
I forget, I forget the name of the company, but there was like a law services. They only have one in Hawaii, but it was Abacus? kind of like a HM. What was it? Go ahead. No, I was saying, was it Abacus? I, I don't. Maybe. I don't remember. It was like uh, this prepay. It was like prepay legal oh. services. Oh, okay. And uh, they had to go in. They had no physical representation here. So, you know, my goal, my goal whenever I go in and there's vendors that have us come in just for the physical part is to build a relationship with them that says you are a trusted provider. And hopefully we're on the vendor list and, and, and hopefully we're available when they call. Hmm. So I'm, you know, it, it all comes down to building relationships not only with your customers, but with the vendors. Because oftentimes, how many times have you heard, I got these two IT guys working on my problem and they can't even get along with each other? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. So just make it get along. You know, I, you want to be the guy that ends up, yeah, I just called, you know, called my IT guy up and uh, they, uh, they interfaced, they took care of it. I didn't even have to get involved. Huh. That's a good idea. That's a good yeah. idea. I've had similar experiences where I like went to offices and I had to call vendors and you learn the software and you might as well yeah. make use of that knowledge. All right. What else you want to go over? Yeah. So I think one of the last things I want to talk about was I just installed a VoIP system called Ring Central. Have you guys ever heard of that? Ring Central? No, I have not heard of that one. Yeah. So I believe Google Voice just bought them out and, um, Google, of course, Google Voice used to be Grand Central. So um, there's a ton of similarities between the two, except there's for Hawaii, there's something special about Ring Central. Um, what's special about it is that you get an 808 uh, area code, <laughs> um, okay. Google Voice, and and um, and uh, Magic Jack, or you know all those all those other traditional VoIP yeah. uh, over the counter VoIP programs don't have 808 area codes. Really? So, uh, we do, yeah, they don't they don't have 808 for some reason. And um, I've, I've installed one instance of this, and um, I think it's more, I just want to kind of talk about my experience. I'm not necessarily for or against it yet. I have yeah. to kind of feel out the, the call quality, because I think that ultimately a, the phone's got to be a phone. Um, you know, even when you have an Android phone or a BlackBerry, it's got to be a phone first. So... Um, but I did want to talk about how easy it was to generally set up the program. They come basically plug and play. Once you take your order, they're fairly inexpensive. I want to say they're like 25 bucks a line. Um, you can get an 800 number. Um, but one of my friends told me that an 800 number isn't cracked up to what it's, what it sounds like. You know, it doesn't apparently under SEO stuff, an 800 number doesn't, um, doesn't give you the bang for your buck, if you will. So you want to make sure that you're adding local numbers for uh, SEO purposes. Okay. That's good to know. Um, but was it, what was interesting was that you're able to manage your phone calls. They have a, a soft phone that goes on your windows machine. They've got an Android app. Um, you can do call forwarding. Um, there's music on hold. You can do some looping. Um, really, really interesting process. I, I actually liked, you know, we, I used to work next to guys that ran Cisco phones, IP phones, and I just saw the paperwork and, and the headache that they had to go to, to move around, you know, a couple hundred or a 1500 phones. And it just seemed like a big project management problem. So when VoIP came up, I thought you had to specialize, but I'd say for an office of five or less, this is a no brainer that people should be doing this. Um, what's the name of it again? Ring central. Yeah. Ring central. Ring central.com. Ringcentral.com, yeah. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Oops, there we go. Cool. Looks pretty good. Starting an yeah, you can take, the, take the phone. You can ring multiple phones at the same time. If you guys are familiar with Google Voice, there's got a lot of that. You get call recording, um, call transfer in the middle of the call. Um, we've had the phone, you know, you have that digital breakup um, because of bandwidth issues, very similar to what we experience with Skype. But um, I haven't had it consistently, um, and I'm only in my first week. So give me give me a few weeks, and All I'll right. I'll get more background. But for an office of five or less, this is a no brainer. And, and how, much, they, how much does it cost? Uh, um, the phones are about 150 to 200 and change. Um, the phone I've got next to me is just a Polycom. It's kind of their mid grade. I don't know if you guys can see it. Let's see if I can. Oh, okay. Uh, Common office of, phone. Yeah, yeah, it just looks, you know, looks pretty easy here. 
Um, and then uh, you can set up your extensions that show up on the screen. Um, you know, if you, you just dial the 800 number, I think they do branding. So you can do some reselling. Um, so they do have like reseller packages, things like that. So if you're trying to set up, you know, if you, if one of your business models is, I set up a uh, rudimentary VoIP, VoIP um, setups. What you can do is you can make it really secure too. You can recommend that they have two types of bandwidth. You can set up QoS with a switch. You can, or you can do nothing. I mean, I, I wanted to install this thing kind of white box right out of the, right out of the box. I just wanted something real generic. I plugged it right in and to see if it would work, to see what would hang up. Um, as long as it'll get to the internet, the phone picks up, the quality is pretty good. The thing you got to watch out for is the, um, the time servers. There's some ports that need to be enabled. So if you've got, if you're restricting public access or something on the way out to, you know, to mitigate virus viruses or anything like that, right. then you got to open those ports up or give it a public IP. I see. But, uh, yeah, it's got, the interface is pretty easy. Huh. Um, yeah, I, I actually really enjoyed it for a small office. It's so we're saving, let's see, let, let me, so besides the technology, even though that's why we're here, the technology, um, the way we, the way we made this decision was we were spending for a Nortel product for, you know, three different sites that we have around, around the Island. We were spending around 800 bucks a month. And I think we're spending around three now. So, wow. Yeah. That's a no brainer. That's a huge ROI. That's like a few months. Definitely. Good stuff. But yeah, it's always good to, know, to learn about new, uh, new businesses and new systems that do this kind of thing. It's, it's where yeah. phones are going and they do have apps for all the, the platforms. Yeah. Hmm. Very cool. E easy one. It calls out very similar to Google voice. Very cool. All right. Uh, should we go over to emails and voicemails or do you have anything else for us? I like it. Go ahead. All right. Got a bunch of emails here. Let's see if we can catch up on these things. And we'll play some voicemails. This is from Alan. He says, um, for some reason, I am not eliminating these from my bin, so I don't want to do any repeats here. Mike says, hey, Steve, I just fixed a, fixed a strange black screen issue on a Dell 1526 laptop, and I thought I would drop you this email for you and all the Podnuts listeners. A college student brought me this three-year-old Dell running Vista with a black screen that I assumed was probably just an inverter issue. Wrong. The computer would not boot, would not show anything on the screen, nor an external monitor. The computer had a couple of blinking LEDs that indicated faulty RAM, but that was not the case. After a little Googling, I found others with the same problem. It seems the fix was to replace a dead CMOS battery. Of course, this requires a full teardown of the laptop to get to the well-hidden $3 battery, but this is what caused the laptop not to boot. Just wanted to pass this on. That's from Mike from Maine. Okay, guys, for a Dell 1526 that doesn't boot and you're getting blinking LEDs that would normally indicate RAM issues, replace the CMOS battery. I love emails like this because he's like, described the problem, gave the solution. He, ha he, he fixed it. He handled it. He's sharing the knowledge. I love that. So uh, thanks for that, Mike. And then, um, Greg, just chime in on any, on any of these if you want. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to use your line. And I'll, just, I'll just yell out RAM or something. <laughs> okay, just guess. I love guessing. Okay, let's see. This is from Mr. Tech Pants in the Podnuts forums. Let me see if I could uh, I'm not log in the forums here yet. So I'm typing in my info. And here it is. There we go. I'm using my Linux Mint machine, which I wrongfully criticized the other night. I'm using Google Chrome on it now. It's running much better. And the email should be, if it's still there. Let me pull it up right here. Uh-oh, it's not coming up. It's not coming up, Mr. Tech Pants. I don't know why. Okay, here we go. Okay. Sorry, geez. Oh, gosh, I did it all for this. He says, on one of your shows, I don't remember which one, you are wearing a T-shirt that said, no, I am not going to fix your computer. Where did you get that T-shirt? I want one of those. Maybe I'll just have one made up myself. I got that T-shirt at Micro Center in Philly, but I assume that they have them on Think Geek. I think that's where they, they get their T-shirts. But um, 
it's pretty all it's just a plain black t -sh black t shirt with like aerial font and says, No, I will not fix your computer. Gets uh it gets a lot of attention when you wear that around. People would normally ask you, Can you fix my computer? They ask you the exact opposite of what the shirt says, but anyway, it's okay. Next email from Nuno. He says, Hello, my name is Nuno. I'm a member of your site. He's talking about the uh, laptop repair videos. And uh, I really like the videos. I learned a lot. Good job. But I have a problem with a laptop, HP G61 400 SP. It does not start. He actually says, he does not start. So I guess this laptop is a boy. He says, um, he does not start. When it, comes to the operating, when it comes to the operating system, it shuts down. It keeps doing this and leaves no access to BIOS. I've tested the memory, the hard drive, and everything. It works fine. I, I already booted through the BIOS battery, but nothing. Restart normal, the BIOS... Uh, I can't read. This is, this is not readable. Oh, I'm sorry, Nuno. I can't understand the uh, translation here. I already booted through the BIOS battery, but nothing. Hmm. I'll answer that one one-on-one -on -one and see if I, could, if I could translate it out. Sorry, Nuno. Ram. <laughs> he said he tested the memories. He actually said memories in the email. He tested the memories and everything's fine. Nice. Um, gosh, this is from Ivan. He had a problem here in a Veritech 7100 series 17-inch monitor laptop. Uh, I was working on a couple months ago. The power light comes on, the battery appears to be charging, and in sleep mode, the light is also on. Searching the internet and in TechNib, well, I was able to find that sometimes a Veritech computers, when the battery goes bad, it won't start, even without the battery. I bought a new one, and the problem persists. It appears to run, but nothing comes out. The screen stays black. I call motherboard on that one. I mean, you got any advice on that one, Greg? Nope. Yeah. Motherboard sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, the, the traditional stuff works, right? You remove everything, and if all you got is a motherboard left, then guess what your problem is? I agree. He did add something. He said, because well, I, I recommended motherboard. He said, one last thing. When, when the machine turns, let's say, on, I can press the CD button, and it will open. Also, if I press the numlock key and caps lock key, nothing happens. Yeah, that's definitely motherboard. I mean, if, if a computer's getting power, you could still open the CD drive, because that, on the CD drive, yeah, it, it does get its power from the motherboard, but still, I would still say motherboard on that. Then he asked where I buy my motherboards from, eBay. That's where I used to buy all my motherboards from. eBay's the greatest place for uh, laptop parts, I gotta say. All right. This is... Um, let's see. Laptop keys. Hey, Steve. On Podnuts Daily, someone mentioned that they replaced a full laptop on a full keyboard on a laptop simply because a function key F11 was missing. I know you've mentioned this in the past, but just to remind everyone that you can purchase individual keys for laptops at a very decent price. I recently purchased the missing letter D for a compact Presario V2000. The cost for the key was only $4.99, plus a small shipping fee. Here's a site I use. They have videos on how to replace the key. And this is a great site. I actually included this site in my laptop repair videos. If you bought them, you, you will see the link. The site is laptopkey.com. Um, they're really awesome, and they, have, they sell keys, and they also tell you how to install like almost every key. It's really good. I do have to say, though, for $4.99 plus a small shipping fee, you could probably get a new keyboard for a couple bucks more yeah. for a V2000. So, I mean, it just depends on what you want to do. Those V2000, on a, on a machine as old as a V2000, those keyboards get kind of beat up, so maybe other keys are on their way out. It's good to buy sep separate keys to save money, but keyboards have come down so low in price. Again, eBay is the place for that. So, Okay, that was from uh, 123 Computer Repair. Here we go. This is from Paul. He says, uh, "Hi, a customer received an e a, cu a customer received an email today that looked like it was from SBC Global." Okay, so he's a computer repair tech, and one of his customers received an email. Looks like a phony email. It was said it was from SBC Global. The message was to the effect that they were clearing out their database and needed the username and password out of the e of the email account. The warning was that. Um, by not providing the information, their email account would be removed within 48 hours. In two words, a scam. Here are the rules of thumb to follow. Number one, never respond to any email asking for account information, credit card information, social security numbers, answers to secret questions, and so on. 
Two, when in doubt and worried, call the financial bank, the internet service provider, or any other company directly to verify, or you can also email them. Three, do not reply to any suspicious emails or clicks or on any link or, or click on any links in suspicious emails. Four, links and emails have become increasingly dangerous, even when the sender's address is someone you email regularly. They could have a spam bot on their computer that grabbed their address book and email logon information. Frustrating for you and your friends. Yes, how do you deal with this? Let's say you find a cool video on YouTube and go ahead and note its name and send the email saying you check out this video and note it on YouTube. And note that it is on YouTube. The sophistication of spammers, hackers, mob-based computer criminals, and many others continue to grow by learning ways to communicate. That defeats their techniques will follow you to avoid that uh-oh moment. And you might be interested to learn about the disk imaging that will also allow you to clean, allow you a clean recovery from serious malware, viruses, operating system corruption, or hard disk crash. Simply put the software. Simply put, the software takes a complete picture of the hard drive, and when any of the issues mentioned occur, this picture can be put back on the hard drive as if nothing happened. If you are interested, please email me. I'll send you more information. Um, as a final note, when in doubt, do not click on it. As a final note, when in doubt, do not click on it. Okay, I get what you're saying. Either call your friend to verify they sent it, use keywords to search what they are trying to show you, or similar method. An ounce of caution can save you a pound of headache. Um... To learn more, this is a little commercial, it looks like, that this guy sent. To learn more, go to FTC... Oh, no, no, okay, I thought this was his website. This is from Paul. Okay, sorry, Paul. He says, to learn more, go to ftc.gov forward slash spam. ftc.gov forward slash, or forward slash spam. Sorry, Paul, I thought you were plugging your own site after the your, uh, your announcement there. That's from Paul. He's from techimproved.com. I do appreciate that. Thank you for that. Email Paul. Let me see what else we got here. I'm gonna I'm gonna do that's it for now. Got a ton of voicemails to play. We're gonna play the voicemails tomorrow. So uh, stick around for those guys. We got about six or seven voicemails to play. Just want to make sure my Linux Mint machine is up to the task before I go trying to do it this this show and screw everything up. Um, hang on a second, Greg. Maybe we can play a couple emails. Are you in a hurry, Greg? No, I'm good. Okay. Let me, uh, I stopped the recording for a second. Let me see if I can fire up some of these voicemails. Let's make sure that it works. Okay, input number seven. Let's see. Tinker right now doing stuff for family and friends in the garage. And ain't doing anything professional. Nah, but let's uh, just let's just do the voicemails one tomorrow. One. I I don't have it all set up. All right, let me start the recording back again. And we are going now. Okay, so if you want to tune in tomorrow, we will play all the voicemails. If you want to send us a voicemail, call us at seven zero seven six Podnut. If you want to send us a voicemail. You could uh, or send us an email. Just send it at mail at podnuts.com. And, Greg, if you want to sign up for the show, what do you do? <laughs> you go to podnuts.com forward slash guests. And uh, hopefully hopefully you, you actually hear this at the end of the, the show. <laughs> <laughs> I gave Greg a hard time coming on the show. It was you, wasn't it, Greg? It was, Gre uh, yes, it was, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Greg's like, how do I sign up for your show again? And I go, well, the Podnets Daily will answer all your questions. That was. Oh awesome. man, I got the I got the third degree on that, brother. You know, I have a button on it. <laughs> I have a button on that. Sorry, you got the you got the brunt of it. But um, no, I'm still, honestly, <laughs> honestly, I'm really happy you came on. Uh, you're very knowledgeable, and uh, I I hope you uh, sign up for the future. Would you be interested in that? Oh man, I'm all over it. I really appreciate the opportunity. I do have some parting words for 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 the guys out there, if that's all right. Absolutely. Whatever you want to say. So the last thing is, you know, we essentially manage our customers' money when we're there, especially when we're charging $150 an hour or whatever your rate is, in the sense that we need to be able to think for the business and, and our customer. And uh, unless you're Thomas Anderson, you know, being, being visited by Choi, uh, we need our customers more than they need us. And that means being able to communicate effectively 
while um, being organized and technically ca capable. I think that's really, really important for everyone out there is to communicate and to be organized. Good, good point. Guys, take heed of those words of wisdom. I um, want to thank everybody for watching, listening, streaming. That's going to be it for Podnuts Daily for today. Tune in tomorrow. We'll play all the voicemails, I promise. And send me more if you guys want. Talk to you then.